there, I'm Asgin and I'm Daniel and welcome to Art Talks for Beginners. If you're wondering whether a painting is by Degas or Delacroix, then you're in the right place. Welcome. Welcome. In this episode we will review a painting which is uh, quite deeply psychological and it has innovative design. <laughs> Let's start with you Daniel. Okay. What do you think about so, this painting? What do you see? I mean, my first impression is that there's a teaching environment. It looks like a classroom. Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman in a darker clothing who is yeah, lifting something from a corpse, looks like some sort of muscular tissue, uh, and showing it to the others. I think they're students. So mm -hmm. my guess is this is a medical lecture earlier than the 1900s. Yes. It's <laughs> very different to the way that we, uh, we do it nowadays. There's also a book in the bottom right, mm -hmm. and I see that they are holding papers and they may be making notes. Let's look a little bit deeper in, into this image. Uh, as you have guessed, this is a lecture. And it is a lecture on anatomy, so that is an anatomy lesson. Hmm. I guess that's quite unusual for maybe this period. I'm guessing it's maybe 17th century. And that's mm -hmm. maybe a bit unusual to look inside the body then, because I know that there was a lot of respect for the dead before that. It was kind of yes. not okay to cut bodies open, even for science. Yes. Good guess on timing first. 17th century is correct. And... The anatomical correct the correctness of doing anatomical studies is actually it's depending on which region yeah. you look at this topic. Okay. Because if if you're talking about more Catholic countries like Italy, more southern Europe, then doing anatomical research was really banned because according to Catholic belief you cannot really cut up bodies. They mm -hmm. have to be whole right. before they go to the other world. Mm -hmm. And but in the north, and this is a painting from the north, it's, it's from the Dutch lands, it's from Holland, uh, then it was more permitted. Okay. And having anatomical uh, lessons was something that they did for public. It was mm -hmm. a public event. Yeah. Uh, it was more like a demonstration. And they even accepted people in this anatomy lesson. And they generally conducted these in, in all theatres, in, in common places like theatre squares where people could just watch. The, the people who pay for this, they dress up, sometimes there's music, there's food, and like they just go there and watch. To the opera. <laughs> a little bit, it's like a public event. In this painting, actually, they're doing one of the anatomical studies, anatomical lectures, mm -hmm. and this is taken from a real-life event uh, done in 1632. We know even the exact date today. We know the people. <laughs> I know the date because it's in the back. Yeah, <laughs> now you have it. a bit of clue, yeah, exactly. I had uh, uh, yeah, good eyes. <laughs> yes, and uh, this time we know the people. The person who's conducting this lecture is mm -hmm. called Dr. Nicolas Tulp. He mm -hmm. is a Dutch doctor. He is a, uh, he is a member of the Amsterdam Surgeons Guild. Mm. So the people we see in the painting are also members of this Doctor Surgeon's Guild in Amsterdam. His students? Or... Not necessarily, they okay. could be, but basically they are commissioners who paid to be included in this painting. But most probably they are doctors, they are fellow surgeons of Dr. Nicolas Tulp, mostly his students. And they... all of these people paid to have uh, their portraits inserted into this image. Why would they want to be painted, uh, painted when they're looking at a dead body? It's because it's a document. Okay. Because it's documenting like I who was were there. in the... Yeah, like I was people. there, who mm. were members of the guild at that time, especially when they have changes in the guild. Mm. Maybe they are coming from the management of the guild. Uh -huh. So they want to be documented in history, and that's what they did in Amsterdam at the time. The guild ordered paintings at every intervals, every five, ten years, from the very famous painting of the period. So they wanted it to be documented and they just wow. displayed all these paintings they acquired on Amsterdam Hall, mm -hmm. uh, on the Surgeon's Hall. So they displayed them in their courts. That's what they did. What an unusual tradition for a scientific body. It's strange, I think, for a med medicinal body to have like, Maybe. let's get painted. <laughs> Imagine the hospital staff. <laughs> when you look at it with the modern mind, yes, but. At that, that time, in Amsterdam, in northern countries, when they have those guilds, they always document these uh -huh, things. Okay. If they come from uh, producing fabrics, for example, they have another guild and they just have their portraits painted. If mm. they're guards or military, they have their painting. This is 
very, very common okay. in the Dutch lands of the, of the time. Mm. About these anatomy lessons, about these dissections, uh, we should remember the fact that in, even in the north it was permitted once a year. Ah. In Italy, in southern states, southern countries, it was not permitted at all. That's why Leonardo or Michelangelo dissected uh, dead bodies in secret, mm. because if they were caught, they were doing something illegal. Right. But in the north, but of course, a hundred years later than Michelangelo and Leonardo, this one, this one is almost hundred years later. So mm. there's some time difference and there's more allowance to do these things in the north. But it, even then it is permitted once a year and to Halloween. dissect a body no. <laughs> <laughs> a certain time. <laughs> Halloween would be the right occasion, most probably. And the body of the person should be an executed criminal who was executed the same day they did this anatomy. Wow, he's really pale. Yes. <laughs> considering he's been executed the same That day. is to show he is dead. He's truly okay. dead. To, <laughs> to, to create that. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not cutting up a real person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. To <laughs> make it <laughs> absolutely clear. And uh, when you look at the painting, the most important figure is, of course, Dr. Nicolas Troop. Mm -hmm. And most probably, he paid the most amount of money to be the center figure here. Mm. And when you look at him, he's different from the others because he has this fancy Dutch hat. Yeah. And his, his color is a little bit fancier as well. Considering that this is a dissection, there are still some things that are missing. In a normal anatomical dissection, we should have a person who prepares the body. Mm -hmm. There's, that's called the preparator. And that person's missing here. Okay. And somebody like Dr. Troop would never ever cut the body because he's like high level professor. Mm -hmm. Why should he cut the body? It's somebody too else, too dirty. This kind of dirty work should be done by the preparator. So he should only be showing things to people. That's why in this painting, we don't see any cutting tools. Mm -hmm. The body is cut open, but it is not Dr. Nicolas Troop who who does that? What he does, he, he only dissected one, one arm, the left arm. He's uh, pulling the muscles and tendons with, with, with a tool and showing people if he pulls those muscles, how the fingers would move. And look at his hand, really look at Dr. Tube's hand. He's making some gestures with his uh -huh, fingers. With hand. Probably he's mm -hmm. pulling the right muscle to move the right finger. Ugh. He says, if we pull this muscle, then this finger will move. Yeah. If we pull that muscle, this finger will move. That is the story. I don't like saying this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that is not matching with what we expect from a real anatomy, anatomy lesson, is that the body is never open first in the arms or the legs because the mm. internal organs decay yeah. faster. Right. They first open the chest. Mm and they just take care of the internal organs first. They like look the at those things yeah, yeah. first, and then they get to the arms and the legs later. Yeah. Also, something you notice is, is the book, the big book of anatomy on the right-hand side. It is expected to be a book from 1543. It's called De Humani Corporis Fabrica, The Fabric of the Human Body, mm -hmm. uh, written by Vesalius, uh, which is a common anatomy book of the time. Okay. So we can see that Dr. Toop is uh, opening up the body, showing things and maybe reading reference. things from the book, or right. it, it's a reference for the people around to look at while wow. they're doing the, the section. There's a different level of interest among the people who are looking at the, um, at the <laughs> lesson. Some people are kind of checking their phones and some people are like really interested. <laughs> Talking with each other at the back. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the spectators. Uh, this is, when, when you look at them, that was what I mentioned as deeply psychological. Because mm. when you look at those figures, you see their interest level is different. Their emotions are different. The first few figures closest to the corpse, for example, they're very interested, they're mm. very surprised. They're both leaning in. Yeah, leaning in, they're mm. more interested. And the figures on the left are a little bit more distant, a little bit more reserved. The two at the back are actually making a connection with us, looking mm. directly. One of them is at. taking notes and drawing something, it looks like. Exactly, he's drawing, actually, he's making a drawing of the arm. But mm. at the same time, this list includes the name of these seven spectators included in this class. He so wrote, this is a historical record. He wrote down the name of his friends. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> who's, who's present in the class today? <laughs> the 
most important person on that list is uh, Rembrandt. Yes! <laughs> he gets the biggest text. And why do painters sign with their names? I don't understand. They, well, normally that they do it in the bottom. That keeps close to, we, to, to beginners <laughs> like idiots yeah. like me in the, like 400 years in the future. Normally they sign it in the, in the bottom corner, though, don't they? Just like a... he, did, he did something different. That is very interesting in this one, is that this is the first painting Rembrandt uh, signed with his full name mm -hmm. as Rembrandt. Okay. Because normally, before that, he used to sign with capital letters Rembrandt Harmansun Leiden. He's from Leiden, mm -hmm. from Holland. And in the beginning, he only used the capital letters R, H, and L in okay. the previous painting. So since he signed this with his full name as Rembrandt and make it very visible to everybody, that's why we believe that he felt confident enough mm. to do that. And when he painted it, he, it was, he was 26 years old. So it's pretty wow, young for young. an artist. Yeah. But he's proud, so it's like his debut thing. He's like, now I'm an artist. Almost. I believe so, because he used, to, yeah, he used to live in Leiden, in a smaller city. Then he moved to Amsterdam, which was a much bigger city, not the capital though. But it was a much bigger city with a lot of things going around, a bigger art scene. And the first commission he got in Amsterdam was this. Okay. So it was very interesting for a young artist like him to get such an important piece. They could have given this commission to another painter who was more experienced with those things at the time, but somehow he got this. Yeah, this is the story of pretty much every artist moving to New York. Oh, maybe. <laughs> they but all go there and want to that was his it. like big, uh, big move. His breakthrough. A breakthrough yeah. piece. It was actually because. What he did in this painting was very innovative, mm. and that just brought a whole new career to, to Rembrandt. Mm. You said this painting was innovative. Yes. What am I missing? <laughs> Where's the innovation? Where's yeah. the innovation? Exactly. Good question. In order to understand this, mm. I have chosen another painting for you to compare. This okay. one is from the very famous painter of the period in Amsterdam, Thomas de Kaiser. Okay. That is called the Osteology Lesson of Dr. Egbertson. Uh, so you're going to look at this and mm. compare it with the Rembrandt piece. Okay. Ooh, I'm nervous. First look at the, uh, the Kaiser painting. Yeah. How do the figures look? So they're arranged around, they're seated, they're all looking towards the center piece, which is the skeleton. Uh -huh. Some of them are gesturing at it, some of them are pointing at it with a little... Yeah. Do you feel they're connected in the scene? To each other. To each other. Yeah, I think so. They all look like they're sort of wearing the same kind of clothes. They all have the ruffs. They all sort of look a bit... Look, looks wise, yes. Yeah. But uh, being in the same place wise, they're not actually. Oh. Because it looks more like several portraits collaged into the same mm -hmm. painting. Right. Uh, they you all can... have the same amount of detail, you mean? Yeah, they have the same amount of detail and also they just... They just have their positions taken mm. and you can remove them, you can remove the heads with different people. It doesn't create this uh, mise-en-scene that, that Rembrandt creates. When we go back to Rembrandt, you see all these figures have this sense of unity. Mm. You really feel that these three people are sitting in the same class, maybe in different roles, and they're interacting with the body. Some of them are not truly interacting, but they still give this feeling that they're in the same room and in this, in this presence of this class. So more of a moment than of individual portraits. Of exactly, people. exactly. What the Dutch artists before Rembrandt did was to, to put several portraits, it's, it's like a multiple portrait composition, put mm. several portraits together and just form a picture for the guild. Right. But what Rembrandt did is he showed a moment in time for us mm. in this anatomy lesson. So it doesn't feel like a multiple portrait, but it looks like a scene, actually. When you look at it, you wouldn't think that that was designed specifically for a That's guild true. upon commission. You yeah. would think that I'm seeing this anatomy lesson. A moment, yeah. Now it's time to guess the period. Uh, I know when the painting was painted, because there's a clue in there. So, okay, so it's Baroque. Exactly. Right, 1600s is Baroque. Uh, if I didn't know the date, I would have guessed because of the light work, the body is unrealistically pale yes. considering he, he died today and then there's the light from the figures and i guess a window maybe over on the left casting single light source yeah and the body is w very well lit mm -hmm. and the other figures are quite dark as they keep 
getting in the back, they get even darker, Very they blend right. with darkness. Yeah. This is what we call... Uh, this is chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro, yes. exactly. The Italian word chiaroscuro for light and dark. Yeah. So this is a typical Baroque example of chiaroscuro, but there's something very interesting here is that Rembrandt has never traveled to Italy. Oh. He has always remained in the north of the Alps mm. in the Flemish Dutch land. So he has never been to Italy. He has never seen a Caravaggio painting. So how, does how he... could he get this idea? Yeah, I don't know. That is the question. The reason is <laughs> there are painters who have been to Italy and seen Caravaggio painters, paintings. They, they bring back the tradition of this very dark chiaroscuro, very intense chiaroscuro to the Flemish Dutch lands and they built their school in Caravaggio uh, characteristics in that style mm. in Utrecht, in, in Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So this is called the Utrecht Caravaggisti today. Uh -huh. Painters from that school like Hontorst or uh, Terbruggen are examples who lived in the same period with Rembrandt. So Rembrandt has seen pieces from Hontorst or Terbruggen. So he used the chiaroscuro technique by getting second -hand. impressions, yes, secondhand yeah. through yeah. through this Utrecht school. So he has seen this through others. Another feature of of the Baroque style is also on the composition. Mm -hmm. uh, the composition is very dynamic. It's not symmetrical as we see in Renaissance, yes, you might left, notice. Left heavy. Very left oriented. Mm. Tulp is not in the middle, he's a little bit on the right and the other figures are more squeezed on the left of the painting. That creates a bit of dynamism that we don't tend to see in, in Renaissance. Mm. There is also one thing that creates a bit of perspective is the dead body. You see that the dead body is mm, uh, facing, from yeah, facing right. to us mm. from left to right. But when you look at the dead body, do you think it has the right proportions with the body and the legs? I know the legs look shorter now. You said that's shorter, right? Yeah. But I assumed that was because it was at an angle to us going away. Yeah, but it looked funny. Yeah. The reason is, actually, this painting was designed to be looked at from the left side. So when you look at this painting from the left, yeah. the legs look much longer. Uh -huh. So when Why you see it? this painting in real time, when you move from left to right, the legs are really long on the left, and when you move towards the right, the legs get shorter and shorter, and it <laughs> looks amazing, crazy. I have been in the museum last year, and I have shot a video. Uh -huh. I will add this after this video, and then it clearly shows how it differs when you look at from the left and from the right. Wow. Is that because it was designed for a specific place? Yes. Uh -huh. Why do uh, these painters choose this topic rather than in the baroque period it's usually like catholic religious. imagery religious imagery trying to have an impact on you and draw you to the church why this is not a church good question this is actually true but at that time they're actually still doing the religious paintings yeah but all the religious painting commissions are given to italians mm -hmm. italian mm -hmm. artists even mm -hmm. in the north they prefer more italian artists because that kind of Anti-Reformation right. uh, tradition came from Italy more, from the Catholic Church. So they are, especially if they're for Catholic churches, they're given to the Italian painters. So what remains to the Dutch Flemish painters, more Protestant origin people, is actually pieces like this. Mm. More like genre paintings, paintings showing ordinary life, portraits, landscapes, still lives. That's why in the North, because all the other commissions go to the Italians or they're not so interested in religious imagery as, as the Italians do, those kind of uh, forms, genres of painting have been developed and they were done mostly by the Northern painters, mm -hmm. not the Southern ones. Mm. That's why we see a, a, a guild employing Rembrandt to do a portrait painting of their members. So is this at the Rijks Museum? No, this one is actually in Maritz Weiss. It's in The Hague today. Hmm. That's all for today on Rembrandt's painting, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Chop. Thank you very much for watching us. Stick around for more 17th century CSI. <laughs> and stay tuned for Art Talks for Beginners. Thank you. Goodbye.